Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello, welcome to today's presentation, Sun, Beauty or Beast, presented by Dr. Sunil Dewan, dermatologist with the Center for Dermatology, Cosmetic, and Laser Surgery. Dr. Dewan completed his dermatology residency at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, Florida. He is board certified with the American Board of Dermatology and the American Board of Internal Medicine. Please welcome Dr. Dewan. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate being invited to give this talk and uh, I hope to uh, give you some information and educate you all over the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes on the sun. The sun is the beauty or the beast. That's me. I'm both board certified in internal medicine and dermatology and I've been with the center for the last 32 years. I'm also a clinical adjunct assistant professor at Stanford. The skin has many functions, including protection, temperature regulation, sensation, and secretion. There are three layers of the skin. There's the top layer, the epidermis, the dermis, and subcutis, which is the um, lower uh, layer that is below the dermis. It mostly consists of fat. The skin cell migrates toward the skin surface and pro provides a protective barrier. It takes about 20 to 30 days to reach the top. And in certain skin conditions like psoriasis, it goes much uh, faster, and that's why you get accumulation of uh, thickened areas. The pigment cell is an important cell. It's called a melanocyte. And the woman on the right tends to have more than the woman on the left. She also tends to have more melanosomes, which are the uh, kind of small collections of pigment within uh, the uh, melanocyte. And so the woman on the left tends to have less of them and less melanosomes. The woman on the right tends to have more of them and more melanosomes, and obviously more protection because uh, the pigment-producing cells add protection. The hair follicle is another structure that's important in the skin and includes the sweat gland, the sebaceous glands, and the hair shaft. The sun, it's the giver and the taker of life. Some important facts about sunlight. The risk of sunburn is greatest between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Up to 90% of sunlight can penetrate cloudy or overcast days. Some light fabrics and wet clothes can transmit a large amount of sunlight to the skin. Hats and beach umbrellas do not provide full protection. Sunlight is reflected by sand, water, porch decks, and snow and UVA rays can penetrate glass and plastic. A great example of point number five is if you go to Lake Tahoe and look at the ski instructors who are also tennis instructors in the summer, they tend to have a lot of sun damage. And I'll show you some examples of sun damage later, but they tend to be some of the best examples of year-round sun exposure, getting a lot of reflection from snow in the winter and other things in the summer because they live at Lake Tahoe, which is also three to five thousand feet closer to the sun so th that's a, that's an issue what is ultraviolet radiation it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum and it gives you three kinds of rays ultraviolet b ultraviolet a and ultraviolet c the uva uvc rays are absorbed by higher up in the sky so you don't see them or they don't come down to hit you UVB and UVA rays are the ones that are responsible for all the sun damage, skin cancer, aging, turning, having brown spots, other things that you don't want, and skin cancer, of course. This is kind of a good representation. So the UVC rays kind of never hit your skin. B goes to the first layer and C goes to, I mean, B goes to the first layer and A goes deeper. A and B are the critical ones. UVB radiation has a certain wavelength. It's the skin burning rays. 
It's most intense during midday, less intense during winter months, more intense closer to the equator, and does not penetrate through glass or plastic. So generally, this is the one that varies based on these factors. UVA radiation, which is the skin aging rays, occurs all day, all year, any geographic region, and penetrates through glass and plastic. So you want to be very careful about both of these. You can't just protect against B. And previous sunscreens used to protect only B. Now we have UVA and UVB. And UVA actually is now found out to be probably as bad or worse than UVB. UVB rays are mostly absorbed by the top layers of the skin surface. They cause skin cancer and produce a sunburn, tanning, photoaging, and photo damage. The UVA rays penetrate deeper. They intensify and combine with UVA, UVB to give you more damage. They probably do contribute to skin cancer, not may, and they cause long-term damage such as premature skin aging, dryness, roughness, wrinkling, and sunspots, things you don't want. What are some of the variables of sun exposure? Skin type is very important, probably one of the most important. This was somebody I trained with many, many years ago. Light-skinned, relatively light-eyed, though you can't see it in this photo. Blonde hair, light-skinned, burns almost consistently whenever he goes out, and tans very slowly, so he burns first before tanning. He's probably a skin type one or two. This is kind of a skin type three, probably. A little darker skin, still light eyes, doesn't usually burn, tans before he burns, darker hair. Kind of somebody, the first gentleman's probably from Northern Europe, Scotland, Ireland, uh, Sweden, Denmark, above, fairly high in Northern Europe, Northern Germany, mid-Germany. This gentleman's probably from mid middle of Europe, probably the uh, you know, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Russia, those areas. Um, This gentleman's probably from Southern Europe, uh, Middle East, Iran, northern parts of India, uh, those areas. They tend to you know, have almost no burning, almost always gradually tan, uh, gets less sun damage, but still has some damage because they, they don't have complete protection. He has some, most good protection, but not complete. And that's a skin type four or five. And the next one is a skin type five to six. African-American heritage, a little darker skin, never burns, always tans a bit and has a low but no, not zero risk of skin cancer. So as you approach the equator, you get darker and more protected. As you go away from the equator, you tend to get less protected and, and get lighter skin because as we evolved, uh, we needed to get more sunlight in order to survive. So we got lighter and lighter and lighter as you move northern into the northern uh, hemisphere. Uh, and the people who are very light-skinned in the, in the center of Africa or other central air, uh, equator countries, they would die off because they get skin cancer at an early age and they would not survive and they wouldn't have children and, and progress. Uh, people uh, of, uh, uh, from China, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, they tend to be skin types 4, 5, and 6 uh, and tend to be, be in the darker skin types and tend to have less of a risk, though we, do our, we are seeing skin cancer in that population as well because they've had a lot of sun uh, early in their life. So there you go. There's four pictures, but actually skin, skin, six skin types. So on the upper left to my left, or possibly to people's right, the very fair skinned gentleman has the highest risk of skin cancer. And the woman on the bottom there on the side has the lowest risk, but not zero. Time of the day, as we've talked about, uh, middle of the day is probably worse. Uh, sunny days are better or more uh, risky than cloudy. Geographic location, obviously, if you're in Miami or Hawaii or Denver, which is closer to the sun or closer to the equator, you'll get more of, an, uh, of a risk. Altitude, Denver is obviously worse than being in the flatlands. And reflection, so if you're a ski instructor and a tennis instructor, you're getting reflection from the water and from the snow and other things, So as we talked about. The ozone layer is not a big deal anymore, but 34 years ago when hairsprays and other uh, propellants were causing issues. We had uh, this as a problem. There was a big gap in the ozone layer in southern Chile, big incidence of skin cancer in southern Chile, and now the gap, I think, is filled in. So.
So what are the effects of the sun? You have sunburn, tanning, aging. Some people are allergic to the sun. You have diseases from the sun, such as lupus, which is an autoimmune inflammatory condition of the skin that gets worse with sun exposure, and then skin cancer. The sixth one is the most important, but the others are important to you as well. So what are the skin manifestations of sun damage and photoaging? Well, you start with sunburn on the acute side. Over time, you get skin that becomes rougher and drier. You get what's called mottled hyperpigmentation in the center. You get fine wrinkling, deeper wrinkling, precancers, which are called actinic keratoses, and then finally leads to skin cancer with chronic damage. The space between acute and chronic in terms of time may be as little as 10 years. So if you're in your teens and getting burned, you can start seeing some of the fine wrinkling at the age of 25 to 30, deeper wrinkling at the 35 to 40, actinic keratosis in the 40s, and skin cancer in the late 40s, early 50s. So it's about a 20, 30 year time frame, but I've seen skin cancer in a 25 year old, including melanoma and other things, which can be dangerous and potentially fatal. What does sun damaged skin look like? Well, it's wrinkled, it's sagging, it's tough and leathery, it's got red, yellow, brown, or gray blotches, it's got what are called liver spots, which are basically sunspots from sun damage, it's got actinic keratoses, which are precancers, and I'll show you some photos. So, the lady on the left has had minimal sun exposure. The lady on the right, which is my right, which probably is your left, uh, has got lots of sun exposure. She was a farmer. So most of the wrinkling on her cheeks is probably from sun damage. And you can see brown spots there and probably some actinic keratosis, which I'll show you close-ups of. So they're related. One is the daughter or granddaughter. The other one's the grandmother or mother. I forget which. It's been so long. But you can see no damage and damage. And that's basically a progression over probably you can go from the non-damage to the sun damage in the space of 20 to 30 years. This is a lifeguard for 50 years on the, on, in Miami Beach. So most of her changes, except for around the mouth and maybe the areas you know, from her nose down and upper lip, are sun-related. She's got a lot of wrinkling on the cheeks, a lot of rough mottled wrinkling, a lot of brown discolorations, and probably a few skin cancers hanging around that you haven't seen yet. And there may be one on the, le on the forehead on the right, um, that's something that, that's on a, uh, probably she's ha she has something there to get taken care of. Let's we'll show you some close-ups. Nobody remembers uh, Little Orphan Annie, but the sun will come out tomorrow, and then o Orphan Annie is called Ozone Annie, and she's been blasted out of existence. So you can see that on the, on the right there. What are some benign skin growths that you'll get? <clears throat> Well, these are not so benign. These are precancers. They're called actinic keratoses. They're little flaky spots that you can see. You can see them. They almost look like little volcanoes. And then around them is all this brown discoloration, which is sun damage, uh, called lentigenes. So you'll get lentigenes and actinic keratoses roughly in the same area. The actinic keratoses are precursors to skin cancer in a certain percentage. Majority don't develop into that. But you don't know which one will and which one won't, so you treat every single one. The brown spots you don't have to treat, but they just cosmetically bother people. <clears throat> Here's another actinic keratosis that somebody keeps shaving over and scabbing. These are lentigenes. Their back of the hands are very common, mostly left hand more than right hand because that's the hand that gets more sun exposure when you're driving. Uh, pilots will get more on the left than the right. Captains will have it on the left. Co-pilots will have it on the right. Passengers will have it on the right. Drivers will have it on the left. Uh, and then usually on the cheeks. And in the middle of all these brown spots, you'll often find little precancers because one gives you more pigment. The body's trying to create pigment to protect itself. And the other things are precancers from the top layer, not from the pigment cells. Those are precancers called actinic keratoses. These are called seborrheic keratoses. It looks like somebody just threw something on somebody's back there. They're like, they look like warts, but they're not warts. They can occur in sun damaged and non sun damaged areas. You can see all the sun damage on this person's back. You can see all the brown spots, the mottled pigmentation. It looks like, you know, speckling uh, and these little bumps that you can almost pick off, but they're benign. They're the number one thing people ask me about in the office. They say, what are those? 
and I say they're separate keratoses and they're totally benign. On our website is a link that talks about them, tells you what they are, and they're treated only if they get itchy and bother people. But benign, but tend to occur more commonly in sun-exposed areas. There's a theory that they evolve from what are called lentigines, which I showed you on the back of the hand, and they can also occur on their own. So this is the important part of the, the, the talk. If you're asleep, you probably should wake up at this point um, and, and look at this, because this is important. Malignant skin tumors, what do they look like? What are, the, what are we talking about here? Well, the incidence of skin cancer or melan and melanoma, not all skin cancers are melanomas, only a small percentage of skin cancers are melanomas, is increasing very rapidly, about 15 times more common now than in the 1930s. A couple of reasons. Number one, we're living longer. In the 1930s, people died from infections that we had no antibiotics, that would die from meningitis and other things. There was a world war that killed a lot of people. Number two, uh, we're out in the sun a lot more. We're you know, going to Hawaii, and after 1945, when the soldiers came back from the Pacific Theater, a lot of their families ended up going to Hawaii. A lot of them settled in Hawaii. So the incidence uh, has gone up because people are going on vacations to warm areas, getting burned a lot. Um, we're living longer. Uh, and we're, we didn't do a lot of protection in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even up to the early 90s, and now we're paying for it. So 15 times more common now than in the 1930s for those reasons. A fair-skinned, blue-eyed, blonde or red-haired people who come from Northern Europe, again, Scotland, Ireland, uh, the Viking territories, uh, Northern Russia, uh, Northern Germany, those areas, have a high, very high incidence of uh, developing skin cancer. We see a lot of it in that population. Though the people from mid middle part of Europe, um, East Asia, India, Iran, uh, we're starting to see it in them as well because they've had quite a bit of sun exposure as well, but not to the same degree. Can these are cancers. They're uncontrolled cell growth. They need to be taken care of if you uh, don't want to have problems. The three types of skin cancer are basal cells, squamous cells, and melanoma. The third one's the most important. What's a basal cell look like? Well, that's on the side of the nose. It's about 84% of all skin cancers, most frequently in sun-exposed areas, the face, the ears, the top of the arms, the back, small, shiny pink bump, bleeds, it crusts, repeats. People think it's an ingrown hair. They keep picking at it. It doesn't seem to go away. It can do serious local damage and eat away at the parts of the face like the ear, the nose, the lip, the eyelid. Uh, very rarely do they ever spread to other parts of the body. It's very uncommon, one in 10,000. I had one case in my early career here in Fremont of a woman who refused to have it treated on the upper eyelid. Uh, she refused for three or four years, uh, didn't want to treat it when it was small, Five, six years later, it had spread, uh, got much bigger, took over her upper eyelid, finally went into her brain and it killed her. Uh, and then I remember her last words were, when I saw her, she said, I wish I'd taken care of this because it was a slow and painful death. But it's very rare for this to happen. Basal cells can usually get treated. That's a smaller basal cell. It looks almost like a pearl on the, on the skin. It's a scabby area. You see the little scab in the center. It keeps doesn't want to heal. It's usually called a pearl with blood vessels. You can see it's like a pearl with little blood vessels on it. That's a bigger one that somebody didn't take care of, you know, got a little bit worse, and maybe there's a couple of skin cancers on the nose. Again, more sun damage. You see some brown spots. It all comes in kind of a grouping there. And this is a really large one. Uh, this is, you know, if you could look, if you go uh, page up, let's go. This is the good, the bad, and this is the ugly. So this is somebody who, got, who died from this because it went into her spinal cord and brain and killed her. This is somebody who declined therapy for 20 years, uh, just didn't want to do anything. So um, for whatever reason, you can't force people to do stuff if they don't want to. Uh, but then they have to put up with the consequences, which was a slow and painful death. So it spread. But you never should be able to, you should never have to see this because uh, this is something that should never happen. What's a squamous cell look like? Well, it's about 14% of all skin cancers. Often it looks like a basal cell, scabs more. Firm red bump, sun-exposed areas, same thing, face, ears, top of the arms. Really common in people who are follicularly challenged like myself, up here in men, very common. Uh, this morning I saw two men with squamous cells on the scalp, we took care of them. Can spread to distant parts of the body, it's rare. More common than basal cell, but again, rare. I've seen, I think, one case of spread. Uh, there's a bigger one on the jawline. Again, somebody who kind of keep, kept on covering it. The famous thing is uh, it's called a makeup sign. That means if more and more makeup is being put on something, you've got to look and see what the heck it is. 
Yeah, melanoma, again, those of you who are asleep can now wake up because uh, it's important that you see this part of it. So a malignant melanoma accounts for 1% of all skin cancers. It's less common but far more dangerous than the other two that I've talked about. It's a shaded brown or black area that kind of changes. Uh, it's producing melanin, which is pigment. It can spread to other parts of the body and best treated when diagnosed early. I, I probably find one of these every two to four weeks um, in people. I just this morning diagnosed somebody with it. The bi biopsy came back very early stage. Uh, they had, it's usually on the back that we find it that a lot of people can't see, back of the legs. Uh, I found one in the groin of a guy who refused to have me take, you know, he refused to get undressed. I said, you know, it looks you had other problems. I said, you know, you're fair skin. You have a lot of sun damage. You were a veteran from Vietnam. You had a lot of sun damage. You were sunbathing when you were younger. And finally, he said, you know, I do have a black spot on the lower part of my abdomen, and it was a melanoma. And now every time he shows up, he gets fully undressed without me asking when he even doesn't need to. But he's become a convert and has told everybody to have their skin taken a look at. So. So what are the ABCDs of melanoma, which you can recognize, and physicians use this, and you can smartly use this yourself. It's asymmetry. That means if you draw a line through one half, either the vertical or the horizontal half, it looks different. B is for border irregularity. It's an irregular, ragged, notched, or blurred border. It doesn't, it's kind of, it looks like, you know, the, it looks like the, the coast of England or the coast of any island that's got a lot of, you know, Philippines or something. It just doesn't look symmetric or, or even. Uh, you know, a lot of the islands are like that. Madeira, I think, is like this. Uh, C is for color. Color's not the same all over. It's uh, different shades of brown or black and patches of red, white, or blue. You can see this. It's like got f one, two, three, five or six colors. D is for diameter. It's the area is larger than six millimeters, which is the size of the pencil, ra the head of a pencil eraser. And it's growing larger. It's changing. So these are good signs. It's A, B, C, D. Asymmetry, border irregularity, color variation, and diameter. So if you remember A, B, C, D, you'll, you'll be far ahead of most people. There's a melanoma on the face. Uh, it was, I think, uh, you know, regressing in the center. It's going away, and then on the sides, it's popping up. There's a bigger melanoma that's more dangerous, and there's a thicker melanoma. This is pretty much fatal. This means it's penetrated fairly deeply. It's you know, been around for a while, and it's, it's, it's very unlikely you won't have problems with this. It's probably going to spread to the liver and the brain and lungs in different areas. Though we have newer therapies now that we didn't have 30 years ago. Immunotherapies are very promising and can hold it at bay. Melanoma will be fatal if not detected early enough or treated early enough. That means you can't just ignore this kind of stuff. You can't put it under the rug and say, you know, I'll, I'll deal with this later. I'm going to come back, blah, blah, blah. Most people that say they're going to come back never show up. So you think you've had a hard job? This is a true job. This is a women whose nasal sense of smell is much better than men's, uh, and they are uh, in the uh, underarm deodorant business. I think Procter & Gamble employs them, and they get paid hopefully really well to see if the underarm deodorant antiperspirant works. And I hope it works for their sake. Prevention and treatment. This is very important as well. Uh, skin cancer should be treated by a dermatologist or other MD or qualified professional who is trained to do this. Uh, most of us have been trained in our, our practices and our training periods to treat these things, but other specialties can do it. What are the methods of treatment? Well, freezing is something very old that some people still do. We don't think it works that well, so we don't do it. We will do it if somebody's really kind of anxious and doesn't want to, you know, do anything else. Electrodesiccation and curatage, which is scraping and burning it out. We do that for basal cells and squamous cells in very old individuals who don't, want to, who don't want aggressive treatment and maybe are at the end of their life or their families don't want to do a lot and just to get it at, you know, calm it down. Um, surgery is the best way to cut it out. We have two kinds of surgery. We have regular surgery and we also have um, something called Mohs surgery. We offer that in the office now. We've offered it for 50, 40, 50 years. We have a, a new expert that's joined us to, to do this um, and done every Fridays in our office. And the way that's done is you cut it out and look under the microscope when the patient's there and it takes a couple hours and, you know, because patients are sitting around most of the time after the, uh, we cut a piece of it out, look under the microscope, make sure it's out, and then we, we put it together. 
Uh, one other thing that I missed is radiation. That's become very big these days. We also have that offered in our office, and many offices offer it, and it's offered at Washington Hospital as well. Uh, localized radiation can be done for older individuals, people that don't want a, aggressive treatment or uh, who don't want surgery. Problem with that is it requires multiple visits, so you have to just be willing to come in twice a week for four to eight weeks. It's quite effective as well. What are some of the preventative strategies? Well, you avoid sun during peak hours. Go before 10 a.m. or 3 p.m. I have a dog. I take the dog out 7 a.m. and 6 or 7 p.m. So I, I do the same thing. I wear a hat. I wear a SPF sunscreen 30 or greater with titanium or zinc in it. Very important to see those ingredients. We don't use chemical sunblocks anymore. Uh, and uh, most sunblocks are between 30 and 50. Uh, anything above 50 probably doesn't do much. Anything below 30 is probably not that effective. Uh, anything with chemical sunblocks we don't like anymore because I don't think they work as well. There's also some that contain benzene, which is a potential cancer-causing chemical. So titanium and zinc don't absorb. They're very inert. Some of the newer ones uh, with some of the other brands I can tell you about aren't very, they don't have a white sheen to them. They look pretty good. And on my skin, which is a little darker, uh, they look fine. I have it on now, actually. You can't even see it. Uh, wear loose clothing that covers exposed parts and wear a hat. Avoid tanning. Some boards are using a tanning booth. The tanning booth business is dropping, hopefully. I don't see very many left in Fremont. I hopefully don't see any in the Tri-City area. That's pretty dangerous. They'll tell you that they're safe. There's a base tan. There's this tan. There's that tan. It's, in my view, all a hogwash. It's a way for the tanning business to retain customers. And you know, if you want to do it, be my guest. You'll be seeing us and being having things burned off and complaining about my, you know, your skin growths and aging and wrinkles and finally skin cancer. And the first time somebody cuts something out of your nose, uh, you'll become a convert and you won't tan anymore, which I hope you learn from this talk and, and I've stressed to you many, many, many times. Don't do this. This was Miami Beach on my last week of training. I decided to go to Miami Beach and take pictures of people of what not to do. You know, a little bit of sun exposure is fine, but doing this in the middle of the day at 12 p.m., it's not probably a smart move, especially for these fair skin types. Uh, just sitting out there and burning the hell out of themselves. Don't do this. This is a young woman who was in a copper tone ad from the 1990s or late 80s. She never got burned. This is all makeup. Um, somebody like this who's blonde haired, uh, lights, light eyed. I don't, you can't see the eyes clearly, but I think she's light eyed. She's destined for pro trouble if she keeps doing this. So the damage occurs, a lot of it, between the age of 12 and 20. That's the age that you have melanoma uh, starting in patients. I mean, or the, the stimulated by that. So you get the intense exposure between 12 and 20. Melanoma and basal cells probably start or are stimulated and don't really fully appear until later. So that's the damage time. So people who are working uh, in construction or landscaping or outdoors or roofers, roofers are the worst because they get a lot of damage and they do it very early in their lives. A lot of roofers start as you know, union roofers in their late, late teens, early 20s, and they get really burned. So you, you, you want to be, if you're a roofer, it's a hat protection, especially on the neck, scalp, and you want to do um, a lot of sunblock, if you can. Sunscreens, let's talk about that. Sunscreen, sunblock, pretty much the same. Wear protective clothing. You can see this lady's under an umbrella. She's wearing a hat, she's wearing sunglasses, because uh, the incidence of cataracts goes up with sun exposure. Um, and you can see, you know, she's protecting herself as much as she can. She's wearing a one-piece bathing suit, which is, you know, unlike a two-piece, it uh, keeps her somewhat protected. So, what does an SPF factor mean? It's a burn time without sunscreen, and then burn time with sunscreen. So you divide, so somebody, some very well-paid individual, I'm sure, puts their arms underneath an artificial sun lamp, and they see how long it takes for them to burn. So, SPF 15 means it takes 15 times the same amount of time. SPF 30 is 30. SPF 50 is 50 times, and et cetera. So the, the theory is that and this is a gentleman. He's a headhunter from New Guinea. He posted a photograph for one of my friends. One of the gentlemen you saw earlier was a resident with me in training. He went to New Guinea, <laughs> took this photo from me, and gave it to me as part of my talk. You want to be like this guy, especially his face. He's totally protected and totally covered. He's darker skinned. He's got coverings almost everywhere, he's never gonna probably have a problem. There's another way of stressing protection. I, I mean, I don't think you need to be like this person, but this is a great ad that gives you lots of, uh, you know, covering. This person's never gonna get skin cancer on her or his foot. I think it's a her. 
Yes, yeah, so SPF 30 or greater with zinc or titanium. This is a brand that, uh, Elta 46 is what I use, but you can pick anything you want. I'm not a spokesman for Elta. I don't get paid extra to use it, but I use it because it's very light. Um, any one of these. There are, there's a new one called um, Dry Touch Zinc. I don't have a good photograph of it yet, but I will have it soon. Um, and it just came out. It does, it's more uh, uh, titanium and zinc, and it's uh, made by Neutrogena. It's, it's nice, it's a little greasier. Makeup has with sunscreen. Now there's powders. Color Science makes one. There's a few other brands. Uh, it's usually 30 to 40, I think. Lip. Now there are now some blocks that are SPF 30 and 50. Neutrogena makes it. Vaseline makes it. Coppertone makes it. Uh, especially people who are roofers, uh, outdoors, a lot of damage on the lips. Titanium dioxide and zinc oxide with SPF 30, UVB, UVA blockers that you will use regularly. Other ingredients like avobenzone, parasol, octal methoxycinamates are good, but can be more irritating. And we don't use them anymore because they, they may have an in increased amount of benzene in them. So we tend to stay away from those. Most are good. Look for ones that are lighter. And if you have oily skin or moisturizing, if you have drier skin, many people will go to Costco or Walmart or Target and buy the one on sale. Not a problem. The ones on sale tend to be greasier. You will not use them. If you ask most of my patients, say, how much sunblock do you have in your bathroom? I got a ton of it. I said, do you use it? No. Why don't you use it? It's too greasy. I said, why'd you buy it? Costco is famous for selling you tons of stuff, and they have good sunblock, but people tend to pick the one that's, you know, cheaper one or the one on sale. And that's okay, but if you don't use it, you've, you know, muddied up the waters and have a ton of sunblock that's useless. That's good for the beach, but not good for regular wear because you won't use it because it's too oily and maybe it has some of these things that cause that have benzene in them. You don't want to do that. Price does not correlate with effectiveness. So people come in and say, well, I bought the $100 sunscreen. I go, well, you could have bought a $30 sunscreen or a $40 one or a $15 one. they probably do the same thing. Sprays are not as good as lotions or creams. Apply 15 minutes before going out and reapply every two to three hours. Otherwise, the sunscreen is gone. So I have a sunblock in each one of my cars. I have it at home, and I wear it pretty religiously. Water resistance only lasts for about 60 to 80 minutes in water and then must be reapplied. Those sunscreens tend to be more chemically based, so an occasional chemical exposure is fine, but routinely it's probably not as good of an idea. So whenever I go to Hawaii, I take the greasy stuff. But when I'm here, I don't use the greasy stuff because I don't want to look like a greasy person. Always apply after any medication, such as those for acne. So many of my patients have acne or rosacea or are using anti-aging creams. They put it on those things first, the sunscreen goes over it. Put makeup on over the sunblock, so medication or whatever active thing you want to have, sunscreen and then the makeup. Some makeup has sunscreen. Look for those with SPF 30 or greater. Two layers of 15 does not equal 30. The protection that is that of the highest SPF applied. So 15 and 30 is still 30, not 45, and two 15s don't equal a 30. Hope that's clear. So this is a list of sunblocks that I like and use. I use all these but doesn't mean exclusively. You can go to the Consumer Reports website. The, the, uh, there's an Environmental Working Group site. There's a bunch of sites, and I'll give you some, some of these. Elta is a good one. Solbar, Neutrogena, and Avino are good. Uh, commercially available anywhere you want. Uh, you know, Amazon, we sell Elta, some of it in our office. We have Solbar sometimes. These brands are marketed under the name of a store cheaper, so tend to, like the CVS brand, the Walmart brand, all that, they tend to be a bit cheaper, but tend to be oilier and not as pleasant to use. Because of this, they may not be used as regularly as they should. Doesn't mean they're bad, they just don't not use. So you gotta figure out what's, what you're gonna use. So that, that's the important thing that I've discovered. And this question, this morning, two of my patients, I said, what do you got at home? They go, well, I got this brand, I got Banana Boat, which I'm not picking on Banana Boat, but first of all, it doesn't have titanium or zinc. And I said, do you use it? No, it's just really oily. I said, why do you have it? Well, I got it on sale. I go, well, it's worthless. It's sitting there, you don't use it. Vitamin D, not a big problem. Just get enough in the diet or take a supplement. I, I'm low in vitamin D, as is everybody else. Increased risk of breast cancer if you're low in vitamin D. So please take vitamin D if you need it. Get it measured. Most of the uproar has been created by the tanning industry or to scare people. That vitamin D is like a big epidemic. Well, some of us are low, some of us aren't. And if you don't want to take a supplement, eat more vitamin D containing items and talk to your primary care. 
Do a monthly skin self-examination. Early warning system. Do this if you're at high risk. Obviously, if you've got skin like me, you know, I'm a little darker. Probably don't need it. Uh, I, I still do it. I look at myself and make sure. I have my wife look at my back and check myself out and make sure that there's uh, nothing like that. Uh, you should actually look at your pets. Dogs have a melanoma incidence. Uh, and I'm a pet owner, so I'm a big dog fan and big cat fan now. I have a dog and a cat. Uh, and I do look at them sometimes. And any they do get skin cancer, so look at them. And, and there's no real good way to protect them. They tend to have a natural protection with their, with their hair. But underneath, you know, in, in the areas that aren't protected, they, they can get burned. And they, they do have an incidence of skin cancer. And ask your vet about this. Do this if you're in a high-risk group, not necessary. If you're in a low-risk group, obviously, like me, it's probably not as important. This is a brochure that you can actually get online at the American Academy of Dermatology set. I'll, I think I've got it at the end of the talk. It tells you how to do it. It's pretty easy. It's like a preventative thing, like a breast self-examination. You look at your skin, and, and in men, the, the, uh, the, the uh, testicular exam is, is probably a good thing to do for testicular cancer, especially in younger individuals. The back is a bad area. You can see it on the on number five there. The back, number four, the, 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 the back of the neck, not uncommon. The back of the legs, those, those areas. Underneath the arms, those are places you don't think of. And I have cut out skin cancers right here. I've got at least three or four that I can think of. And here, and those of us who are follicularly challenged. Look for growths or moles which are changing in size, color, or shape. Remember the ABCD rule. Remember that. That's very important. Growths or moles which are itching, bleeding, hurt, or won't heal. A, B, C, D, S. S is symptoms. I added that myself. How can you recognize melanoma? Well, it's asymmetric, A. Irregular borders, B. Non-uniform color, C. Diameter, any sudden growth. Remember, the head of a pencil eraser, 6 millimeters. And symptoms, itchiness, tenderness, pain, bleeding. Bleeding is a big one. Remember this, excessive tanning, sun exposure, and the numbers of sunburns is directly related to your risk of skin cancer and melanoma, especially if you got a lot between the age of 12 and 20, especially if you worked outdoors, if you were a lifeguard and didn't protect yourself. Get a yearly complete skin examination by a dermatologist or your personal physician. If you're very fair-skinned, if you're over 40, it's like you know the annual colonoscopy. It just should be part of your routine. If you're my skin color or darker, not that important. If you have lots of molds in your skin and you've got my skin color, then you probably should be examined because the incidence of melanoma is also higher in, related to the number of moles you have, not just the number of skin uh, sun exposure you've had, but the number of moles, especially irregularly shaped moles. And the melanomas appear not in the existing moles, though you can have them appear in existing moles. I just diagnosed them this morning. More commonly, it's a new growth. So somebody has 50 moles on their back, but they have a new one looks different. It doesn't look the same. It's kind of the, the horse among the zebras. So if you have a bunch of zebras that are out in the African plain and you have a horse in the middle of them, the zebra's got stripes, the horse is brown, that's the one you got to go after. Any suspicious growth should be brought to the, to the attention of your dermatologist or physician ASAP. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, oh, this might, you know, provider thought this was nothing. Well, if you think it's something, push. Because a lot of times your Sixth sense is better than sometimes, you know, what we think. So if somebody says, you know, this really bugs me and it's changed, I'll take it off for them. And I've been surprised. I thought it was nothing and it comes back as something. So we're not always right. Now, there are new artificial intelligence-based photographic things that we're working on that may be more precise. So in the next three to five years, we'll have machines that will be able to do it maybe as good as me or maybe better than me. We're training them right now, as a matter of fact. What are some resources that are very useful? Well, our website has links to skin cancer sites, common dermatology sites, sites about other things like seborrheic keratosis. What is a seborrheic keratosis? What does it look like? Why do I have it? There's a link that was there. And www.aad.org, that's our, our uh, national dermatology organization. Very useful. Got a lot of patient information. I like .org sites. We happen to be a .com because we're, you know, a practice. But I like .org sites. The other one that I didn't mention on here is Mayo Clinic. MayoClinic.org is very good. They, they have a lot of links, and they're not trying to sell you anything. So it's great. This is a very old. I think this was from 1993. You can see it right there. It's from the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, and it's uh, somebody out in the middle of nowhere, you know, the desert of Mojave probably, and saying I need more sunscreen and not water. 
thanks for inviting us. That's the number, and that's the website of our of us. If you uh, you can always uh, so, you know, I think now we have an ability on the website to answer questions. So general questions we're happy to answer, but specific things you have to see your dermatologist or or anybody you you like. We hope that you've learned something on on this uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duan. Is it possible that we could ask you a few questions right now? Absolutely. Great. Um, so one of the questions we have is, if I do get a sunburn, what at-home solution would you recommend for good recovery? Obviously, based on your, you know, obviously consulting with your primary care or dermatologist, but we recommend people for sunburns, number one. The, one of the best moisturizers that helps soothe the skin is um, not aloe vera, surprisingly, coconut oil or Vaseline. Vaseline is, is very good. Coconut oil is good. It's more natural. Uh, and if you if you don't like petroleum products, shea butter is really good. So moisturization is good. A little bit of hydrocortisone on the most tender areas that's over the counter, or a mild topical steroid like Triamcinolone that you can get from your primary care is very effective. And you cover that with the moisturizer. Surprisingly, Advil, 200 milligrams twice a day for a couple of days, reduces it fairly quickly. So we give that advice out to a lot of people. So sunburns from Hawaii go away much faster with those three things. A little topical steroid, just a few days, don't fear it, moisturizer, and Advil. Obviously, if you can take Advil, if you have kidney disease or liver disease, check with your primary care. The next question we have is, um, are there any concerns with using self-tanners? There may be a concern with acetone being potentially a cancer-causing chemical, but other than that, it's not, it doesn't cause skin cancer that we know of, and it's called dihydroacetone, and it's controversial. I think occasional use is probably not a problem. It doesn't protect you, though. Okay. And the last question we have, my work is outdoors, six hours a day, five days a week. How do you recommend I take care of my skin, mostly my hands, face, and neck? Well, if your outdoor job allows you to wear a hat, one of those wide Tilly, I hate to promote a brand, but Tilly hats, there's also uh, a, a company called Sun Protections and Solumbra. These are online, you can, and they've got hats, they've got the things in the back that make you look kind of geeky, I guess. Um, and I shouldn't talk because I have a pocket protector sitting right there. <laughs> but it does, it, uh, it, uh, it is very helpful because it protects your neck, and the hat is on, and it's got an SPF of 30 in the hat. Sunblock on your face and on the back of the hands. And if you wear gloves, uh, very difficult for a roofer to wear gloves, but, you know, that's, and there are gloves that have SPF written on them, and they're commercially available or, or at, the, at, the, at stores. I guess you would recommend looking a little geeky than to have skin cancer. Probably you don't want me to be cutting stuff out of you. Definitely or better. Or freezing you. or The hat yeah. is better. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Well, thank you. So this, this concludes our program. Thank you for this insightful presentation. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in. The entire broadcast of today's presentation will be available on our Facebook page and YouTube.